So hello, everybody. Hi, Rafael. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. You I know, you were, fro you, I thought you were frozen <laughs> in the picture. <laughs> you know, you know the music I played. Actually, I wasn't listening to be perfectly frank. Oh, what? you didn't. Okay, it was this. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. No, that's great. It's just so beautiful. Why it's so short? It's gorgeous. So I want to start here, actually, because uh, you were going to become a pianist, a, a professional pianist. Um, when you were living in Argentina and then you became an architect and and you recently created a piano. And I know that you are a lover of classical music. Do you know to, to how, how often do you go to listen to uh, classical music, to concerts? Oh, uh, uh, practically every, every night. I mean, you know, I, I have a... <clears throat> uh, I, I have a very big budget for, for that. So I, uh, yeah, I do have uh, during the season, probably for sure every other night, I, I go to Carnegie or to the Philharmonic or to the opera. And you know, it's a, it's a wonderful thing to participate in. It keeps you, it makes a way of getting out of all of these other things that we suffer in architecture. And your wife loves classical music as well. That's true too. Yes. Okay. And can can you hear the difference in pianos when you when you listen to the pianos for so many years? I uh, I it, as long as it's not reproduced, uh, you know, uh, mechanically. I mean, in 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 uh, in a concert hall. I mean, or or not even in a concert hall, but in sort of direct audition of, of of the sound i i i do have a very clear uh, picture of uh, of what is sounding and how it's sounding and so on yeah so but what I, is the story of this piano that you created so recently um <clears throat> it was the result of a, a series of uh ideas that really actually came first from um, somebody that approached me at a time in which uh, Steinway, you know, was sort of kind of creating this piece of furniture with different designers. And, um, and uh, it's interesting to see what other people have done. Uh, and I... I mean, I've known the the instrument for such a long time that I I I, I always thought that it, you know it was almost uh, a, untouchable. Say, I mean, you know that all of these ideas of changing the color or shaping some parts of the box or changing the legs and so on. I mean, you know, were nothing other than superficial moves to create an object that could sell basically better because what I consider to be the wrong reasons, which is that it doesn't contribute to the evolution of the instrument in one hand, and on the other hand, that doesn't actually improve the sound. And uh, so I, I said, I don't think you need to redesign this instrument. It's perfectly OK the way it is. And then many years after that, uh, it occurred to me as a result of a conversation with uh, Daniel Barenboim, uh, who, um, you know, had a, a piano redesigned for himself uh, uh, that was actually a reconstruction of Franz Litz's piano that he played in Italy, where the piano is now, uh, when he was very young. And he was very impressed with the... Uh, uh, or more than anything, he recollected or thought that it was an interesting thing, this idea that pianos before, rather than having cross strings, I mean, were parallel strings. And um, for a person, as you know, Daniel has this, uh, from his very early years, I mean, this uh, um, equal dedication to conducting, which 
is um, is also a kind of a vertical sound producing uh, instrument, right? I mean, the orchestra sounds like this, and the piano sounds like this because you know this sort of fabulous invention that Steinway made at the turn of the century, the past century, uh, was to cr cross the, the strings, which creates a much more um, sort of kind of integrated sound. Uh, he preferred to do that. And um, and, uh, and and so he, he didn't prefer, he wanted to go back to, uh, to create a piano for himself that sounded more like an orchestra. And, um, and uh, Chris uh, Mane, who is the uh, same person that built this piano, built a piano for himself because he was actually already building pianos, uh, historic pianos. It's a luthier in, in Brussels, in Belgium. Um, wonderful man and a wonderful group of people, you know, this, um, artisans that are hopefully not uh, not totally disappearing, um, and um, in, when when I was I was at the opening of that piano, and I talked to him many times, and then I started thinking that there was something with the instrument that people have actually um, uh, not really focus on, which is the fact that. Uh, the origin of the instrument is an instrument that is not wider than this, you know, it's one and a half octaves, and, and it was always uh, increasingly becoming wider and wider and wider. And if you really play the piano, you know that the key for good sound is that you have to put your hands inside of the keys, in other words, apart from many other things, but say, uh, you don't, you don't, touch the keyboard from outside, you have to put your hand inside, right? In an angular condition, when uh, all the keys are parallel, uh, your hand is forced to have a, a kind of an angle on your wrist. And not only that, but your body has to displace in one direction more than in another. So there is a physical condition. And, a, a, a sort of kind of calisthenics, if you will, that have a lot to do with the technique uh, that people have really mastered incredibly well. I mean, you know, some other some other people that of a of a smaller frame have a a, a great deal more difficulty to to play in an eighty six key keyboard. But it, this was overcome, and I said, I, I thought that there was something that I didn't understand why nobody had done. Then with time, I realized that there were a couple of historic precedents on this idea, but nobody had actually built it in a way that was more ergonomic, if you will. Um, now, the effect of the ergonomics, I didn't think that it was really that fundamental because uh, of what I just said before, which is that uh, great artists, I mean, have mastered that geometric difficulty incredibly well. But then I said, you know, maybe there is something about this idea of the parallel strings that in a, in a radio condition has an effect on the sounding board, which is the bottom of the box, which you don't see in, in any piano, but it is sort of floating inside, which is really where the sound is generated. Um, and then I had this idea that sort of if the thing was radial and the strings were straight, uh, like in this picture, for instance, the uh, in the same length of the instrument, you could get a larger area of uh, sounding board. And that, you know, kind of triggered another curiosity, which is to say, well, if the area, if you go from a B model, that's uh, one of the categories, I mean, you know, in, in terms of sizes of the instrument, when you play in a concert hall, you need a larger instrument. And that has a lot to do with the capacity of the instrument to generate volume, right? Not just to project it, but you know, the basic volume is a function of the size of the instrument. 
in the same length, if you open it radially, the area of the sounding board increases close to 28, 29%. And that, and, and that was the reason why I decided to build it, to see what happened. And it took us six years and a little bit more than that by now. And um, it was one of these sort of fascinating exercises because, you know, as an architect or as a designer, you, you pretend you know what you're doing, but really you never quite know exactly what you're doing. And in this field, the level of intuition and the mysteries of how sound is produced and the incredible complexities of the engineering of having something which is slightly, I mean, it's a, this, this transformation, the only thing that enables you to uh, do is just that your hand, when you're playing the treble or in the bass, rather than being like this, is sort of like that. So this, this very shift in the angle frees up your, your wrist and the capacity of people to adapt to this, which we tested over many years, is absolutely astonishing because, you know, I, I, I have films of great pianists, friends of mine that went to try it. And, you know, one in particular that starts playing a very difficult piece and he start, all of a sudden starts laughing. In five minutes, the guy could actually do much better uh, uh, technically, simply because it doesn't have to force your hand. So, so the, the process of adaptation on the technical side, I still think is really pretty spectacular, which doesn't mean that other people don't play incredibly well in a straight keyboard. Well, here, here you are in your piano. Is this your home? That's my house, yeah. <laughs> So you know what is very interesting, uh, This in this series, I'm going to have uh, conversations with 10 architects. You are number four. And mm -hmm. all the first four are very, very connected to classical music. Mm -hmm. um, we had uh, Calatrava, who is like a lover of classical music. Then we have Charles Renfro, who, like you, Planned to be a, a, a musician before he went to architecture. And last mm -hmm. week we had Tom Main, who told me, by the way, that he knows you well. And yeah. uh, he he's his mother was a pianist and he's very much so. Do you think there is something between architecture and music that is that can be noted? Uh, I, I have a very sort of kind of radical view on this. Uh, um, you have probably heard or remember Goethe's um, uh, comment about the relationship between music and architecture as if they were, you know, that, that, muse, that architecture is frozen music, right? Um, I happen to know that I could, but I happen to completely disagree with that. I mean, they really, truly have absolutely nothing to do with each other in terms of neither the creative process nor the um, uh, sort of compositional ma makeups or techniques that one uses. Uh, it is it is about, um, one is about the highest levels of abstraction, the other one is a hundred percent the most concrete thing that you can ever imagine. Uh, instruments which are very material uh, driven and and very specific uh, apparatuses uh, uh, produce a sound that it is only important not because it's technically complicated or not. I mean, you know, if if you see a flute, I mean, you know, the whole description of how the keys are placed and so on, but none of that is important compared to the five or 10 minutes of sound that you produce with it. And I think that that is, uh, a, a, for me at least, a, is, a, is an experience which I think is fundamentally opposed to the experience of architecture, which I, it, it may have, um, great levels of aesthetic uh, impact, and it may have a great 
many ways of being understood in in many different ways relative to as a human endeavor say but i think essentially uh the the difference in in the ex in the aesthetic experience is so different and and so much detached from uh what what we do every day or what we um uh, uh what we use to to produce objects right i mean you know it's just a non-object thing and it's a to that extent i think that uh i don't think there is a relationship as i, as I always say for me at least if i I mean, it's closer to meditation than than um, than a building or a piece uh -huh. of, right, of anything. You, you know, I want to go back to your. I think your your life story is is really fascinating, and to think that now we are in twenty twenty two, and you you did your first competition in nineteen sixty two. It's <laughs> it's. Well, wait a minute. I can't do the math. What is it? It's, a, it's closer, like it's almost uh, 50, uh, yeah, 50 years, 55 years, something like that. You know, I, I started very early. Yeah. So it's, it's really amazing. And I want to go just a little bit uh, to your past. Um, when you go, when you were born in your mm -hmm. and then Uruguay, Uruguay, Uruguay. Uruguay. <laughs> and then you uh you you moved very early on with your parents and you lived you grew up in Buenos Aires and then you when you started your career thereafter and you were you were a, a, a partner in in an architectural firm that mm -hmm. was known as MSGSSS mm -hmm. and you had uh, th was this your house, by the way? Is this the house? No, no, no. This is a design. Somebody a else. For a okay. uh, no, but I mean, but did you design it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And then you had an amazing success while living in Argentina. And, you know, one of like the, the peak of your success was 1972, the World Cup that yeah. was held in Argentina. Do you love soccer? Very much so. I, I always enjoyed it very much. Uh, and it was an incredible opportunity. I was, uh, uh, you know, it was a result of, uh, you know, a very peculiar political situation in the country too, as you might remember. Um, uh, so, yeah, I was there. <laughs> well, then, do you st what's your favorite uh, soccer team now? Uh, well, I think it's Man United, Man, Man, Man City in Manchester, right? Oh, and, okay. You know, there's a big difference in in uh, between that league and all the other ones. I mean, and I, I've been lucky enough to work with them many times, and, and it's a wonderful group of people, and they are doing terrific work, uh, not just in the sport, but also in this process of elevating the sport to almost a... A, an educational um, and, and 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 sort of kind of university level, if you will. I mean, you know, the the investment in people and in the connection to a community that football has started to produce just recently is something to understand also from the sociological point of view. I mean, it's, it's the one thing that doesn't have political affiliation, and 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 in spite of all the critics. Uh, uh, about the ownership and the overly monetization of the whole sport. Um, people involved in it are incredibly smart and and very much dedicated to community, simply for one reason, which is pretty obvious, which is that's where you get your capital, right? I mean, from from your from the people you you live with. So, so you were there in 1978 in this amazing, um, memorable um, event because Argentina also took the won the World Cup and hosted the World Cup. I can just imagine how yeah. excited, how exciting the time was. But then, you right away after that, you left Argentina, and this is you know when I read your story about you left because 
the, when, when the military took the power actually two years before, but that made it impossible for you to live there. And, you know, it reminded me the, the stories of all the architects in Germany. It's yeah. a pretty much the same thing. I mean, and as a matter of fact, I, I, I must say that uh, uh, it was by far more a, a kind of realization out of chance that the fact that I was uh, either being persecuted or in danger or something, I think everybody was in danger, but um, I remember very clearly, like today, uh, I mean, the the moment of awareness, right? And it had really nothing to do with anything other than the fact that I had a very sophisticated aunt, uh, a scientist living in Uruguay, and and she um, she actually sent me a note um, saying very little. I mean, actually, it was a a clipping from a, a a magazine that was published in Latin America that had a, a conversation between Bruno Walter and Alma Mahler. Uh, it was a, an exchange of letters between the two of them. And she was sort of my aunt. I mean, you know, she was so amazingly smart that rather than giving me an opinion on politics or whether I was quote unquote collaborating by doing professional work in a country that had become a, um, you know, a fascist country, sent me this note, which was absolutely extraordinary. I mean, uh, Bruno Walter was uh, the assistant conductor for uh, for uh, Mahler uh, um, uh, during the, his um, uh, contract at the Berlin Philharmonic. And, uh, and Mahler left because of, he was Jewish and um, and he thought that, you know, his position was untenable and left the orchestra to his assistant conductor that was in his 20s. And this man was Bruno Walter, who was completely elated. He clearly wasn't uh, Jewish and, and, you know, he just talked to the wife of his maestro saying that uh, say that everything is so great and how is uh, Gustav and what is he doing and so on and and he says I mean, you know I, I this is the best orchestra in the world and I'm having and when is he gonna finish the fourth symphony and all of those things and then he said well the only, the only problem is that every so often he said there is some noise here and some people coming to the in the, during rehearsal and rehearsal has to stop and they take everything and they start asking questions to all the musicians and then immediately after and he describes that and says yeah, everything is great and you know we're doing fantastic and the music making is phenomenal and then there is an answer for Alma Mahler who you probably remember who was a, a spectacular lady that basically tells him directly that he has to leave. And he, she doesn't ar ar articulate too much of the reasons for it, but she says, you have to leave. And this kid, he was 26 or 28, left Nazi Germany at the beginning of it, 1939 or 38 or something like that and uh, came to America. And uh, when I read this, uh, these two letters that, that were published simultaneously, I uh, all of a sudden had this complete realization that I was living in a, not in a dangerous place, in, a, in, in the bad place, you see, in a place that had come to accept a condition that, as you know, has been the most traumatic thing for Argentina and for for Latin America for many, many years. I mean, it was the same thing that happened in Chile. I mean, it had happened in Uruguay too, much mildly, but uh, uh, but Argentina was sort of this um, absolutely incredibly dramatic situation, the scale of which people have not uh, really understood yet. I mean, you know, the Vietnam War 
had less people dead, the uh, Americans, that Argentinians were killed without being at war. You know, just simply kidnapped and... So and, uh, did you have to leave overnight like that? No, How absolutely no, absolutely no. I left overnight because I wanted to uh, leave overnight, but not because anybody was sort of kind of pointing a gun to me or anything. But more importantly, I, I think I left overnight also because I was incredibly arrogant and I thought that I could actually be anywhere because, you know, that's what happens when you when you are successful young enough and in a place in, in which, you know, you, you probably don't have your bearings completely in place, right? So I, I really thought that I could come here to New York and and um, and just you know do the same things that I did before. <laughs> and, but, but you, when you first came to New York, you didn't you didn't have a license to work as an architect. You worked a little bit in education. Did you have this um, confident that you're going to become successful, or did you have that fear that maybe you're never going to be able to? practice architecture on the level that you did in Argentina? Uh, you know, uh, it is a, this is for probably, I mean, a much more interesting conversation than talking about architecture. I no, mean, no, no, we're getting to architecture momentarily. A, well, I'll tell you what happened, is a, is, since your question is so pointed, I mean, when you, in my experience, I mean, I wasn't, I have always been an immigrant. I mean, you know, I left Uruguay, who is where I was born, and my parents were from there, and my family is still there. And I went to live in Argentina, and that may sound like the same thing, but it isn't the same thing. I mean, you know, so I always had this um, conf um is sort of conviction that when you when you are in a place and growing up in a place in which you have no backing because you know you're you don't own anything or you don't belong to anything you don't have a tradition behind you um you develop a mechanism which i think is really important for people to have which is to understand that there is always another way of doing the same things you think you do, uh, and it's probably unknown to you. So, I mean, you know, it's a, uh, people also uh, have asked me, how did you manage in Japan? And it was, you know, that going to Japan, so going from Argentina to New York, if that's incredibly difficult, going from New York to Tokyo is, orders of magnitude more difficult because it is really an insular society completely alien to anything we know in mean, the codes and the rules of relationships are completely different and and but if you have the curiosity to understand you asked me whether i was con I, I was convinced that i could i never thought that i that i would quote unquote make it or survive or anything i mean you know you just keep going right and but you have that ability to understand that you don't understand and that's that's the difference between uh you know when you look at the history of empires or conquerors or it's always the same whether you integrate or you try to dominate and at a, at a personal level clearly you cannot dominate but you could also alienate yourself, you see, and believe that everybody's wrong and then things should be done your way. How did you feel when you, and, and by the way, this talk, we're going to focus on New York because mm -hmm. you build all over the world. You, the mm -hmm. body of your work is just so immense. So we're gonna focus on a couple of buildings in New York. And how did you feel when you got your first commission your first serious work in new york what I, was it like what was the feeling did you feel that maybe you could 
now did you feel more comfortable at that point no well it's, it's also interesting i wasn't really um this was a job that appeared practically out of nowhere and how did we make this job into a serious job is the it's just basically by understanding a number of things that the profession probably has a hell of a lot of uh, difficulty adjusting to, which is what makes the commission is a number of steps prior to the commission of which architects are never told or instructed on that uh, are pretty, pretty complex and difficult and, and not difficult. They're different than what you do uh, sit, sitting down and waiting for somebody to knock your door and giving you a commission with a program. This was invented, and it was invented by a very young group of people that had this idea of taking the John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and because they knew the president that was very ambitious, that wanted to do something special, but of course they had absolutely zero money. They were installed in this building, and um, but they knew somebody that had an idea about creating finance for public uh, jobs that um, was completely, uh, uh, you know, it was uh, of the late uh, 70s, early 80s, I mean, certificates of participation. And it, one of these sort of monuments to me to the virtues of bureaucracy, right? So there's bureaucracy that it is impeding things and in this bureaucracy that is the only one that makes things happen and this guy had it was nothing other than that i mean a man that knew that city university needed an important criminal justice college operating full flesh if you recall in the 70s new york was the crime in new york was ramping and you know everybody sort of kind of was trying to leave the city and so on and, and, and so the, he invented a way through which uh, all of this could be paid. And, uh, and we were part of that team trying to make the project happen. Um, and so it, it wasn't the result of, uh, you know, as I say, a commission showing up, right? Or a competition being won. It was sort of like the legwork you have to do to understand how buildings really are produced which isn't in the in the mind of the architect and is a much more complex sociological and economic machine that you really need to be clear uh, about to understand with what is it that you can do that doesn't at all preclude the importance of what design has in all of that as a matter of fact i think it has by far much more importance than people tend to give it, starting from the architects, right? I mean, you know, it's, if you, this project, which is a large renovation with an enormous amount of new construction, is important simply because, to me at least, I mean, certainly not for architectural critics, but to me, because it was the result of people operating in New York trying to provide a way through which the question of crime could be addressed from within as opposed to from outside, right? I mean, you, know, you don't wait for the police to, to act. And by the way, at that time, even the police was actually not very efficient. Um, and it was really an educational exercise. I mean, that had an enormous impact in the city. Um, it became, then it got expanded. Uh, yes. Later. Yes. Uh, and and it, it's, it's a fun, it's a, it's, this is the part I like about architecture, which is that when you get under the, the sort of kind of the spectacular uh, uh, sought after conditions that we seem to be obsessed wise, uh, 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 by, uh, I think there is a lot more of a political dimension to it, if you know what I'm saying. I mean, you know, it's the kind of thing that you can contribute uh, honestly and clearly to improve 
um, people's awareness or life or ability to understand things. And that's the reason why I think this is a profession which has been uh, in a process of shifting, shifting towards nothing other than form making, when in the final analysis is a trillion times more important than the form. Okay. All right, so let's go now fast forward. Do you see my all my my slides, by the way? I I, I do. I have a, I think it's a picture of a, the main lobby at the Yes, college. okay, yeah. I want to make sure. Okay, so fast forward, you, the immigrant, is building a building that really changes the skyline of New York. And I want to talk about this building. And before that, I, I read somewhere that you, it's very, very important to you that people enjoy your architecture. Oh, that, yeah. yes, is it? It's the only thing that is important. <laughs> okay, good. So I want to read something to you uh, that wrote to you, someone who lives there in this building. And she loves it, by the way. So don't be scared. <laughs> Um, okay, she said, the simplicity of the architecture and the scale and proportion of the rooms bring a much needed sense of calm and order to the hustle and hustle of urban life. The enormous square format windows frame the views of New York and beyond in a way that feels appropriately epic, romantic, and grand, allowing the viewer to take in the landscape in a powerfully memorable way. You are left with a sense of awe at it all, an awe that somehow never dims with time. So I want to thank Kelly Behan for writing this to you, and she loves living in this building. Can and you believe then, that I never, ever, ever is the first time I hear that? I never read that letter. I don't never got it. Because it, she wrote it for me, for now. I mean, it's an unbelievable thing. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, this is probably <laughs> the best yeah. interview I've ever had in my life. I mean, <laughs> it's an amazing description. And I don't happen to know Kelly, but uh, I will try to get to know her because, you know, she got exactly the... She's going to love, she's going to love hearing that. And I want to tell you that last week I went, this is me and Kelly, I went to her home and I I want to say that, and I live on 57th Street, I live in a small pre-war building, and I want to say that when the, when you look, New York looks, couldn't look better during, it was a, a clear night, it was just gorgeous. So let's talk about 432 Park, which is, um, one of your most famous buildings in New York, at least. It made you, you know, very famous. And I want to start with talking about the idea of the condominium. So the condominium is a sort, and also this building, the type of tower is something very new to New York because up mm -hmm. until, up until, let's say, you know, the, the since, since, since the, the 30s, really, New York skyline was more or less looking the same. So tell me about this project and what it means to you. Well, this again, uh, it was a, a uh, convoluted process. But let me tell you, since I think I once again, I thank you for the question because it opens a, a the possibility of a real dialogue on more than just uh, uh, you know uh, praising yourself. I mean, I always thought that uh, the evolution of this town was a result of two genius moves. One was the original grid, which actually um, generated the fundamental structure of the city, which is that 
uh, it, it, first of all, it's not, it's not a square grid, it's a rectangular grid. It has inherent to it uh, two things. One is that the monumentality and the almost village-like nature of the cross streets. That simultaneity is what gives on the ground plane the, is this extraordinary variety that, that people enjoy. But this other aspect of it was this sort of kind of totally entrepreneurial approach that the initial administrations had. I mean, it, it, that reflected in two things. In the infrastructure that was uh, over-designed by a factor of thousands, I mean, you know, which is knowing that this town was going to become what it is today. And the second one, this sort of kind of freedom of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, intervention, uh, which is reflected on what essentially makes the city unique, which is that it's limited in footprint and essentially a monument to verticality. I this this particular site could have been solved in a building that was literally. Um, probably less than, much less than half the height of it. Uh, I always thought that when you look at the uh, important high-rise buildings in New York, they were always about work, or office buildings, right? And then if you remember the Twin Towers had a, had a, a high-end restaurant at the top, and it, that was the only moment on top of the, the, the Rockefeller Center RCA Tower in which, you know, in some contrived way, people could actually come and look at this quote unquote object as it is, which is from the top down, because it's, it's what uh, Robert Moses had. Uh, I did a, a project at the Queens Museum that was like the reconstruction of the original a uh, place where Moses worked. And Moses had a model of the city, a gigantic model of the city, the size of this office, um, uh, with every building in it. And he would look at it from the top of it. And I always thought that this was a forbidden thing for, uh, um, for people that could actually you know, be enjoying um, a normal day of living. I mean, you know, as opposed to being working or visiting an important bank or a hedge fund manager and so on and so forth. So I thought that th there was this, um, there were not very uh, high rise buildings for residential. Now there is and, another- and just, This was the building that was there before. Yeah, and it's a and it, what you should see that's a hotel, that's a Swiss hotel, right? Uh, and in it, a I stay there many times. Um, the the site was a complicated site, but more importantly, the the the, the there's another thing, which is that if you really look at the history of the city, the. Uh, and particularly Fifth Avenue, uh, these sort of kind of multi-family homes, I mean, of grand prestige, um, you know, had a, had a, <clears throat> a kind of teaching behind it, which was really also incredibly interesting. There is a building on, uh, I think it's 79 or 80th Street, right across the hotel in front of the Metropolitan Museum. Um, which is a juxtaposition of six homes that are some that are completely. This is the McKean Minor Mid and Wide project that is one of the most uh, outrageous ideas in the world. There are five houses that have five different facades, one on top of the other. The five units are completely different. They are homes, right? So I mean, very expensive and all the rest of it. Um, and I say, well, that's luxury, right? So that's, that's truly luxury. Why? Because you enter into a house that has an entry lobby, and the entry lobby has more or less this ceiling height. And, and that is the kind of, is a very 
good book about the, uh, the it's called The Architecture of Affluence, um, which points out to the best buildings for the moment of great, great economic expansion of the city. Uh, and they are full of, you know, lessons. In, then this whole thing kind of disappeared. I mean, became a, a product of transaction and people bought it and sell them and so on. And then there is this whole thing about the uh, real estate business, right? So in the real estate business is, 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 a, is almost like a movie production business, right? So you say, here is an apartment and then you're gonna be living here and you have these amenities and so on and so forth. And it's great luxury. And then you walk in and the luxury doesn't exist, right? So, I mean, you know, the sense of luxury. What's a luxury? Luxury is your ability to choose. One of the incredible successes of this building is because one of the points that I made from the beginning was that it had to be very tall at that, at that point. Now you that now I can look at them now from here. There are three or four more like this, but they all come later, right? So, I, so the the idea was to generate a space that was both that had enough containment and enough depiction of the views. In other words, that when you are in the job, the, the space, it's not a curtain wall. So you're not in a glass building. So the, the, the structure is the facade, right? And within the facade, there is this gigantic picture window that has absolutely no partitions that frames views of New York as uh, Becky was a Becky, right? Or Leslie or whatever her name was before. <laughs> Kelly. Ke Kelly was mentioning, right? That he said, you see the city in a very peculiar way because it's framed and it doesn't have partitions or anything. It gives you a sense of security because it has a love seat uh, before the glass. So you're, you know, it's like a series of pictures, right? But most importantly, the plan is free. In other words, if you're gonna buy this apartment, you don't want a unit designed by me or by you or by anybody. You come in here and you can do whatever you want, right? Because that's luxury, right? So what you have is a loft that has a central core where there are no columns in the center. So the layout could be changed uh, in so many different ways and that's yeah. what that's what people recognize as a, as a, you know, it's, it's, it hits into the, um, the frustrations that every kind of building that claims to be luxurious gives you, which is it gives you a list of marbles that you can choose from or wood veneer that you can change the color of and then maybe they give you an extra parking lot, right? But the thing is, is that this thing is truly like respects the owner's choices, relates to the city in a way that it is really, in my view, and I'm looking at it as I I'm going to show you that. <laughs> Where are you? Where are um, you? That's my office. This is my what? office. I can see this thing. Um, Where is it? Sorry, uh, the, the building is there. I don't know if you can see it from here. See? No, but where is your office? Where is it? Oh, it's downtown. It's in, uh, just at the foot of the of the um, Brooklyn Bridge. It's an, it's on, a, on an old industrial building that was all full of switchboards there. And you, you can yeah. walk from home to your office, right? From your yeah. home. Yeah. I read it. So, okay, so let's do a little of, of uh, uh, an exercise here because I want to learn something from you. So the 432 is one of a, a series of new towers built mm -hmm. along 57th Street that is nicknamed the Billionaire Row, but that's not what I want to talk to you about. I want to look at each one of these buildings, and I know that you do not approve all of them. But I want to look at each one of your buildings and to hear what you think about it. Is that okay? Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah. 
because I have to say this one, if someone has your, your building, if someone has the taste of modernism, a taste of pristine design of minimalism, that's their favorite. So let's go one by one on these uh, buildings and see what you think. Well, the first one is not exactly a part of it, but because it was uh, the, the, the first one to be built is a Time Warner Center. Mm -hmm. So if you can say something about, as an architect, I can, quick... I can see this is a, um, a, a, maybe I should, if you don't mind, rather than focusing on individual uh, buildings, which is always uncomfortable because, you know, you, 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 I, I do have a position relative to uh, what's going on in architecture today, which is what I was trying to say before. And uh, it's the fact that you are in search of the famous wow factor, right? So you twist things or create conditions that like that do not have anything to do with what the building is for right so for instance this building which is bob stern's building is an extrusion of central park uh, 15 central park west right so it it could be half the height or three times higher than this but it's the architecture of a of of a that kind of period of affluence that built uh, Central Park West um, uh, and, 20s, and in the twenties in the is 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 a kind of is a stylistic exercise right so now the consumer somehow right meaning the person that buys buys for a variety of reasons I mean you know nobody thought that a modern building that 432 would sell and it sold you know spectacularly right simply because it, it wasn't really trying to tick or to mark a box in which you know you are reminded of the fact that you belong to a a society that doesn't exist anymore right so i mean you know because it this is the architecture of the barons this is the architecture of money uh, that created Central Park West is all about stone, a material that is exactly the opposite of what you should use once you extrude it more than 100 meters high. You follow me? So it's a, the fact that it can be done is all great. I mean, you know, it's just, and it was very well sold and so on. This is also, you know, three quarters of the building up to the top, not three quarters, but two thirds of this length is, is just basically a um, you know a pinnacle right i mean you know it's a it's a it's a gesture which actually i think is pretty good looking but i mean it's you not know, i don't think this adds anything to um uh to the the basic topic for me is uh you know what kind of uh living condition you generate because after all that's what motivates the whole thing right so i mean you know if you uh, have you added something to uh a, a, an offer of a way of living which is also sort of kind of integrated um with some idea of improvement you see i mean you know if these apartments are too small or they're completely populated by columns and it's all an effort to try to make it hide and then when you get up the only thing you see is a two and a half foot window uh, which is vertical you know it's sort of impressive too uh, and, and and it's the same with this building this is a compositional building i mean you know it's sort of like the kind of thing that it, it this gordon did uh, to me uh, one of the best buildings that I've seen, which is the, uh, uh, the Burj Dubai, uh, which is a really tall building and a building that it is really a marvelous form. I think this is a little bit less impressive to me simply because I, you know, why does it do this and as opposed to doing some other things? I always say the same, then when you really go back and look at the Seagram's building in New York, uh, you know, keeps beating everybody. I mean, never mind how tall you make it or how twisted you make it or anything. 
and it makes it because it has a dimension of dignity, which I think is something that I think persists and is the sign of real um, uh, sort of uh, art. So uh -huh. I want now to go to a different direction, still in New York. I want to tell you, if I had to go over all the PowerPoint presentation that I prepared, we would have been here for 15 hours. Sure. But we only have 15 minutes. So I want to go to buildings that you didn't, that you, you, you renovated or, mm. expand, or expanded, mm -hmm. rather than built from scratch. And I want to start with a building that ever, anybody can go and visit, uh, Salon 94 uh, on 89th Street. And that building had a very, very interesting history. So I wonder if you can talk about no, it. In two words, it's a, it's a side building to a mansion on 5th that was used to organize parties. And my friend Jeannie Greenberg thought that it could become a spectacular museum slash gallery and and sort of picking up on what existed but also with the help of her amazing eye for art there are a number of i don't know if you have a picture of the main gallery up above in which you enter into a place is that the only picture you have no i have a couple of images so so, so there is a room which is a completely neutral which i think is it's pretty special too. I mean, you know, this is more about the art and how a home could be, which actually wasn't even a home because, you know, this is a party room, you see? I mean, you know, it, and, and it has this uh, extraordinary ability of transformation that Jeannie does to her work in which she, she juxtaposes things that are completely impossible to imagine together and, and sort of hierarchizes again both sides of the spectrum, right? So the, the, the kind of brutal notion of this type of art, um, lighting fixtures which are, you know, 15 meters long, uh, built by a Japanese designer uh, in a state. I mean, it's, it's, it's really the ability to provide a support for a program, which is really genius creation. And I think it's successful, not because of the architecture, but because of the receding of the architecture um, uh, in favor of the impact of the art, which is omnipresent and changing and, you know. What, what was your approach to the material and how is well, it? It's, it's, it's an interesting thing. So because the, the building has once again, this patina of being classically uh, correct. Uh, and it, it isn't. It's not such a brilliant piece of architecture done by a good architect that actually built a much better home uh, on Fifth, which is the primary building to which this belonged to. But it has a history behind, and the this juxtaposition between the spaces of of of, uh, of modern art that Jeannie is so good at. Um, are moments inside of the structure of the building that in which you kind of come in. <clears throat> you don't probably have the picture of the most no, impressive. I don't. Which is a room that does, there has no, that has a continuous section between the wall, the floor and the ceiling. So you enter into a kind of milky state in which you don't see the limits of the space and it's well illuminated. Um, so you don't see the box essentially just by virtue of how is it treated on the edges and that that for instance is a it's nothing other than, i mean it's not a formalistic thing it's just simply a way in which the space dedicated for the changing exhibitions and exhibitions i mean it's the main gallery of the of the of the building has this um, ability of being totally neutral, so you don't read it as a museum yeah. or as okay. a museum. So we have for every uh, participant in our program, we have a section called people and places. I'm going to show you a couple of people and places and you tell me what they mean to you. So we're going to start with this. <laughs> a genius. <laughs> in a wonderful place that probably didn't deserve this moment of Excel, Excel architecture. I mean, a complete, I mean, this is the guy that really changed our lives. 
you know that uh, I know that you are you don't believe in like style, like personal style. But and I don't neither did he. Time. Neither did he, by the way. Mm -hmm. You see, because it, this is is nothing other than an exercise in proportions, which is completely connected to the way the building is built, and this is what made me the person that and the the moment in architecture that means represents, which is a is a person of the craft. I mean, remember his father was a person that is a stone making person. I mean, he he, he started, you know, hitting stone when he was eight. In when when you started your career, he was still he was still alive. Um, he was still alive. Yes. Okay. Are you are you uh, ready for the next one? Please. <laughs> this is my father. That was a uh, a wacky man. I mean, nice uh, nice guy. I mean, unbelievably talented. Uh, uh, he started. Uh, as a as a music director and ended up doing lots of films uh, in Argentina, the period in which uh, um, in which uh, uh, South America was the largest producing country of or region of Spanish speaking, and I remember being in. In, and it was a boom of the country. I mean, everybody was rich and uh, the, pro the, the production houses were sort of direct copies of Paramount or, you know, 20th Century Fox, so you know, the same installations. And, and he was, um, he, he was a, a, a very uh, loving and an intense individual that, uh, m you know, made, probably more than 50% of what I am. I mean, you know, kept what, telling me I was worried. <laughs> what, what do you think, uh, what do you think he would say if you, he saw your enormous success as an architect in America? He, in he, he was, uh, he was, you know, he was a dreamer and he dreamt in a way that uh, was a little bit more than just an oniric thing. I mean, you know, for him, he lived in a dream. And so he believed his dream. And he was, from the beginning, completely, he told me once, completely out of whack and without any kind of real, he said, you're made. He said to me, you know, you know where you're going. And, you know, he gave you this confidence that, is uh, so essential in the education of any, any human being. And it could come from your mother or from your father, but it is a parental thing. I mean, it's something, and he gave me also an extraordinary respect for, uh, a, a, for rigor and intensity of intellectual pursuit. This is a man that had a, the largest uh, uh, book collection that I have ever seen that is the only guy that I know that, and because I saw it, that, you know, he wrote, he wrote, he read um, The Magic Mountain probably 20 times, and he would read it, and and then when he finished, he started immediately after that from page well, one. But what, what was the house you grew up in, in Argentina? What was it like? The, the one I woke up in? I, I the, the one you grew up in. You when I grew up in Argentina, I was in, well, you know, I, I had a very, we have a, a very small suburban home built by a builder that uh, didn't have any particular distinction at all. I mean, you know, it was in, a, in an area of the, of the, um, uh, of the suburbs with the, that was unoccupied at that time. And, people from the movies used to live in that area and then became uh, nothing much. I mean, it's a, it's a, we were not well off at all. I mean, you, you know, it was a struggling family. I mean, you know, working on this, this, this type of job appears to be very flashy and, you know, one compares it to Hollywood today, but uh, not for him. He was, uh, he was always on the verge of very difficult financial problems, which uh, uh, I, I, th I think he didn't have the 
instrumentation to cope with in a funny way. But he was a lovely man, I mean, very much loved by everybody. Uh, died very young. Uh, he, uh, How old? Week. How old? He was 60. He had just been 60 and he had an absolutely massive heart attack and I was next to him, which is also a recommendable thing. <laughs> Okay, I have two more, and then we have to finish. So that's great, uh, that's great, Daniela. Oh my God, I met him him when he was ninety, I believe. This is a man that really propelled uh, architecture out of complete um, innate talent. It's a is the undiversity. The Brazil is the only place that I know that is completely self-referential. It has zero impact from, uh, uh, culturally speaking, from Europe or uh, America. It's, and it has invented practically everything that people need to, are trying to invent today. <laughs> As I said to Saha many years ago, I'm going to show you what you want to do build in 1953, because we were together in Sao Paulo for a crazy conference. And have you ever been to Brasilia? I have been in Brasilia many times. Yeah. Okay. okay, we have two more things and then one question because, yeah. okay, this one. Well, I had lunch and dinner there for 29 years. <laughs> <laughs> you like the same dish. The, the same dish that they named for me, that was the, the spaghetti a la vignoli, which was a spaghetti with Barack olives and more olives and spaghetti, actually. But okay. it was lovely people, lovely people. Last one is this man. I owe him the moment of realization from the letter that I uh that i mentioned to you that my uh that my aunt sent me to my departure there were two weeks and i know i knew marshall uh because he was very social a fantastic singer we had played together a couple of times and um and a reformist in terms of uh, jewish uh, tradition um he was also at that time the uh, uh, secret envoy of uh, Amnesty International to Argentina. And he had actually, because he, he, he had the protection of the sort of religious nature of his job, he had access to almost anything. And he had recorded every single moment of tragedy in the kidnappings and the uh, sequestrations and all the horrible things that appear there and he would write them himself into a copy book a school book and also had when possible um, the parents or the friends or the girlfriends of the victims write into that uh, into that book the experience of seeing when this um, these crimes were uh, happening. Is this, and, is this book was published? No, is oh. this and it's not only one book. It's a, it, like twenty five books. I mean, you know, there was the, there were this thing, and it was all written in in, in pencil. Marshall is dead now, um, but he showed me that book. Uh, and when you are completely in 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 the midst of whatever you call success but you know not being persecuted or i mean when the, when you really are kind of fabricating all the kinds of mechanisms for which you justify injustice and brutality and dishonesty and corruption and all the rest and we all have that right so we at a certain point you need to become uh uh you need to manage that and you manage it up to a point in which you really have one moment of shock. And he showed me one week before I left, he showed me the accounting of the mother of a, a kid that went to, with me to school. That was a fantastic philosopher that 
uh, got killed, also thrown from a plane into the river. Um, but the moment of the kidnapping, when he when they broke into his house and 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 it, actually it wasn't his house; it was his mother's house. And his mother wrote, and I did. I never. The guy disappeared, and I always thought that he was in Barcelona or in Venezuela or somewhere else. And then he gave me this book, and I just went over it, and then I stopped in one page, and the page was the description of the mother of this guy, Galliano was his name, in which the mother described physically how the guy was kidnapped. And Marshall knew that he had been thrown uh, to the river from, you know, 10, 000, 35,000 feet or 20,000 feet or something like that. Um, and, and, and he was a, it's an angel. This person is an angel. Um, and, you know, he had the most fun synagogue in New York to which I went many times. And, uh, and it was, as I say, a guy that loved music and that had this sense of humanity that I think very few people can act upon, both in terms of, uh, of sharing it with the rest of us, but also conducting an ethics that is what made him the person he was. Extraordinary man. So I have one question, just one question from the audience. Uh, what is your favorite building in New York that is not yours? The Seagram's building. Seagram building, okay. Well, you are not too original. I'm not too original because, you know, there is a difference between uh, uh, between greatness and, and, and good. And as I always say, I mean, it's like if you need to name a composer, right? Uh, and as a friend of mine used to say, Mozart was an, an envoy from God, but Bach was God. So what right? did you, who is your favorite? Who is your favorite? My favorite is it's not my favorite. It's the no, favorite. No, no. But you, who is your favorite uh, composer? Classical. There is a you know I have the complete works of Bach in in you know in a box this big of CDs and I think that nothing can compare to that nothing. Okay, you are Bach. Okay, you know my father, my late father used to say to me about his dentist. He said. We are we agree about everything except for one thing. He likes Bach and I like Beethoven. So on that note, thank you very much, Rafael. Have a wonderful day and thanks and for thank being you, with us. Thank you, by the way. Thank you because I we had never met before. And honestly, this has been a moment of joy. And oh, I, I owe you I owe you for that because normally I I I'm not a fan of these things, but you made it really wonderful. That Daniel, and I want to really thank you for that. Thank you, Rafael, and thank you everybody else for being with us. Have a great day. Bye.